The Colonel really didn't care about television to begin with. He wanted NBC to finance the next movie, which was Change of Habit. And NBC said, we'll give you the money. The Colonel was delighted and NBC said, oh, by the way, Elvis also has to do a television special for us to give you the money. Well, the Colonel never told Elvis about the deal he made. When he told him about a television special, Elvis told the Colonel, I don't want to do it. Finkel told me that he wanted to produce and direct it himself, but he could never get through to Elvis. That, uh, he, he tried to get Elvis to call him Bob, <laughs> and he would only call him Mr. Finkel. So that's why I got the call from NBC in the first place. After I hung up the phone with NBC and had turned down the show, basically, uh, my partner, Bones Howe, uh, came over to me and said, Steve, I overheard your conversation. I think you could be making the biggest mistake of your life. I know Elvis Presley. I engineered one of his albums. And I think, personally, you guys would create magic. You, you, you'd hit it off. I called Bob Finkel back at NBC and said, uh, if that offer is still open, uh, I'd be interested on one condition. And Bob kind of laughed and said, what's the condition? And I said, I want to meet him first one-on-one, -on -one, so we, we'll see if we're compatible and we can work together. He said, I'll call you right back. He calls Colonel Parker, and Colonel Parker says, I've got to meet him one-on-one -on -one first. If I like him, he can meet Elvis. If I don't like him, we're not going to set up this meeting. So I trek out with my partner, Bones, to MGM Studios, where the Colonel has his offices. There's a very funny story. And about the colonel asking uh, that I bring French pastries to this meeting, so I think we're having coffee and pastries. <laughs> I walk in his office, I hand him the paper bag filled with pastries, he says, thank you, opens his briefcase, tosses them in, closes the briefcase, and no coffee, no pastries. Then he says, okay, this is the special that I've agreed to and NBC's agreed to that Elvis is going to do. He hands me a quarter-inch audio tape designated to give to all the disc jockeys in America as Elvis's gift, Christmas gift. And what it is, it's Elvis singing about 20 Christmas songs. Well, I knew instantly this is not something I want to do. I go back in my office, convinced this is a one and only meeting with Colonel Parker, and that's the end of it. And Bob Finkel calls me uh, right after I get to my office. And he said, Steve, I don't know what you did to charm the Colonel, but Elvis will be at your office tomorrow at four o'clock in the afternoon. Next day, in walks Elvis Presley. Uh, he had a few of his entourage with him, uh, Joe Esposito probably, and, and Charlie Hodge, and they're waiting in the lobby, and Elvis and I go back into my office. Immediately starts talking about the music business. He said basically he'd been away from the industry since he went in the army for two years in Germany, then he came home and he started a movie career. So it's been about eight or nine years since he's even performed. And he says, what do you think of my, my career now? And, and I was kind of off the cuff and probably bad taste, but I said, Elvis, I think your career's in the toilet. And he laughed and he said, uh, you know, basically, finally somebody's telling me what's reality in, in, in life. You know, he said, I'm not sure I, I can even perform on television. First of all, I don't like the media to begin with. I, I like doing the Ed Sullivan show when I started but ever since then, they put me on television and make fun of me. They put me in a tuxedo, they put a hound dog in front of my face, and they want me to sing hound dog and things like that. He said, it's not my turf. And I said, well, what's your turf? And he said, it's making records that I love. I said, okay, why don't you make a record album and I'll put pictures to it. How's it? That's simple enough. And a few months later, he told me that's the line that convinced him that he should take a shot and do this television show. Steve Binder was the perfect director, perfect producer for that show. He brought all the right guys into the project. We actually met the Colonel first. Both Chris and I had decided we would have a good sense of humor. And we said to him, to the Colonel, Colonel, we're very pleased to meet you and we particularly love your chicken. But the colonel looked at us like, what? What, is it, what does he mean? It's just a matter of he was not very fond of our humor. Elvis was very fond of our humor because his humor is very much the same. It's a kind of a 
kind of a cynical, fun approach to everybody around him. The Colonel told us what he wanted to do. An hour of Christmas music. I said to, uh, to Bob and to Steve, you know, what do you need Chris and me for, or all these guys? You can, you can do this show in, it's, a, it's a, an hour of uh, Christmas music. They both explained to us, we want you to give them an idea. You, know, you have an idea for the show, or you will have an idea for the show. We want you to come up with something that will really excite him. And that's all we needed to hear, because we had the executive producer and the producer and director behind us. We, we were so free, to, we, we just wrote freely. But they locked themselves in their writer's room in my offices, and they eventually came out with their idea of what the Elvis show should be. And Elvis, in the meantime, uh, after our first meeting, had gone to Hawaii to vacation. On the basis that he'd come back, we'd pitch him our idea for an Elvis show, and he'd make a decision whether he wanted to do it or not do it. By that time, I had Chris and Alan in the room with me with Elvis, and they basically did the pitch. Well, Chris Beard is a, a comedy guy to begin with, and he could really deliver on, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do that, and, and he had a infectious laugh, you know. Chris and I were the two right guys to be ready for him, and, and everybody in the, in the rest of the staff was, they were perfect for him. Everybody was trying to appease him, and impress him, and we did. And we impressed him enough to gain his respect. Well, it was terrific because he, he agreed with what we were saying with it, and we had descriptions and, and, you know, for TV, and so agreeable, so encouraging to us. They finished their pitch, which was about, I don't know, no more than 10 or 15 minutes, and he said, I love it, let's do it. And I said, well, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And he said, no, I like it all. Let's just do it. He said, I, 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 I like it. I got a good feeling about this. What I never knew until Priscilla told me years later that when Elvis came home, he said to her, I don't care what the Colonel thinks. I got a feeling about this and this guy Bender. I'm, I'm going to do what he asked me to do. I, I just got a good feeling. I thought Bob Finkel turned out to be the greatest executive producer I could possibly want to have supporting me because he spent his entire time, uh, not on the set, he spent his time entertaining Colonel Parker. He would play liar's poker with them, uh, they exchanged photographs of each other, the Colonel dressed as a Southern Colonel, uh, Bob dressed as Napoleon. Uh, it was just gamesmanship which, you know, the Colonel loved. And Bob said he lost a fortune because he kept letting Colonel Parker win just to keep him occupied. Elvis, uh, when he came into the room, he, I don't know, there was just something special about him. You know, he had other people who described it as an aura. And uh, he looked me straight in the eye and he never took his stare away from me. He asked me, he said, well, uh, you know, I have some ideas for the show. I said, well, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I come from uh, motion pictures and other things, and I'd like to have uh, my guys who are symphonic musicians because I think there's a way of combining that sound with your sound. And so Elvis said, Steve, I have to confess something. I said, what? I said, I've never sung with an orchestra before in my life. You know, if I don't like what I hear, you gotta promise me that you're gonna send them all home and just keep the rhythm section. And I did promise him. I told him, I, I, from the very beginning, I said, I'm never gonna make you do anything you don't wanna do. So he looked around the studio and he said, do you think I could sing with this old group here? I said, why not? You wanna meet him, you know? And he said, yeah. And we went all around the orchestra, he met the string players, and everybody loved him afterwards. Because none, none of that orchestra was expecting anything like this. But he was so decent to everyone, and they all fell in love with him. We had booked about close to 100 lookalikes. 
because we're going to start the show with people, uh, men of all ages and all ethnic backgrounds, and they're each going to do a few bars of, if you're looking for trouble, you're just looking in my face. And it caused a lot of d difficulty for us because we had union problems. And Steve said, you've got, you've got a great performer here. Just let's scrub up on him. You couldn't argue with that. We recorded his guitar man sequence, which was exactly the kind of music that I wanted him to sing. Music that not only had some tenderness to it, but that basically had raw energy, primitive, primitivism, sexuality, anger. I knew he was harboring all of these things inside. It came out in his singing. I mean, you, you see some of the expressions on, on his face when he sings. It's not all just smiling. Jerry Reed wrote the song, and it's about a career that a guy has that he doesn't get thanked much for it. And he's, and he's really, he has to battle his way through it and make a, a lifetime and career out of it. And I had to actually tell Jerry that uh, uh, I wanted to rewrite just a little bit of the lyrics to suit the purpose for, for uh, Elvis' career. I was stunned that he said, I'll do this for Elvis. In this, this song, the lyrics are true to his life. You know, the, the Guitar Man sequence was basically more a parody of his movie career. Even though I justify it by saying, well, it's the story of a poor, you know, guitar man who, who you know, has nothing, no, no money, no career, anything. He goes out of his hometown, finds fame and fortune, and realizes the happiest he ever was in his life is being this poor kid who just loves to play and play his guitar. You know, sort of the bluebird of happiness story. Jaime and Claude are the two choreographers on the show beautifully choreographed show. And the energy was so tremendous in the spiritual, in the gospel, from, from everything, the, the, the dancing and the power of the, that. It was great, it was wonderful. Gene McAvoy is a, did everything that I did in my life until he left Hollywood. He was, he was a great designer and I would use him on every possible thing that I did. So we have this incredible soundtrack. And when I brought them all to the, to the NBC studio in Burbank, uh, welcome to NBC. Elvis was very nervous. And I uh, had decided to put him in this sort of boxing ring stage without the ropes, which made him kind of a caged animal. We had this live orchestra in the bleachers behind him, which you can actually see on a big screen. He was magical. I think I, I, I did two takes of it. In other words, I had him do the segment or I, I did what they call stop and go, where if I felt he blew something or, you know, something wasn't right, I'd just stop and say do it over again and then we'd piece it all together. And we had a live studio audience for that. There were all of these ladies in the audience who were now in their 30s. They used to be 18 years old, but they were still screaming. And, you know, every once in a while, like when we would take a, a break, you'd come over and talk to me. You said, can you believe this thing? I, I feel like this is what I used to do. You know, I, I said, just have fun with it. You know, he says, I know. So he did hound dog, he did blue suede shoes, etc you know, Can't Help Falling in Love, all his classic hit records. It, it was fantastic, and he was having fun. I mean, there's one song that he sings where he says, you made my life a wreck. I mean, just improvising it. Uh, er, uh, was another expression he used. My boy, my boy, that he used all the time. I mean, you know, but it just brought out, you know, his basic instincts and his, and his raw talent, which was what I was looking for. Every day after rehearsal, every day after taping, he'd go into his bedroom and he'd jam acoustically. Whoever happened to be hanging out, Lance Legault, who is his film stand-in, was a musician. He brought a tambourine in. Everybody else, uh, Chris Beard, our writer, 
uh, myself, his few guys from his art entourage, Charlie Hodge, etc. Everybody would be banging on the piano and and uh, hitting uh, guitar cases and so forth. And I said, this is something I've got to photograph. This is what the public is screaming for that never ever got to see. So I go to Colonel Parker and I say, I'm bringing cameras in there. And he said, over my dead body and really was adamant. I mean, you were not allowed. And so I was so frustrated because this is, this is Elvis Presley, this is the magic. After days of hounding him, he finally turned to me out of frustration and said, okay, Bindle, he always, <laughs> after a while started, getting, started calling me Bindle instead of Binder. He said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you recreate it on stage but I won't promise you any of it goes into the show that NBC broadcasts. That's all I had to hear, I just jumped on it. I didn't have any money even for a set, so I used the same set as I used in the stand-up. Uh, and it was Elvis who said, I hear you're gonna recreate it out on stage. Do me a favor, can you get Scotty and DJ to come here to do it because nobody can play guitar like, like Scotty. It was the greatest thing that happened because I called them both they both refused to come because of the colonel, saying the colonel's the guy who broke them up. But because of Elvis, they came, thank God. When they showed up cold, they never got a chance to rehearse or anything, and they hadn't seen him or played with him in years. You know, his, their past came back instantly. You know, the, the ground rule for me is uh, no electronics whatsoever. No, no amplifiers, no electric guitars but they snuck him in anyway. It's Scott, Lee Scotty did, and then Elvis ended up, you know, having uh, a little bit of guitar playing on, on his amp. But generally speaking, it was all what was happening in the dressing room. I think a lot of, especially the Elvis fans, know the story where I gave all the tickets to Colonel Parker, who had kind of promised me he was flying an airplane in from Memphis, would be filled with blonde, bouffant hairdo, fans of Elvis, and. His shtick was, you, you can't give any tickets to anybody else. You gotta give me 100% of all the tickets and I'll deliver. Or else I don't want any tickets and you can have your sponsors, wives and girlfriends and you know, the crew, I mean, whoever you, know, you get as an audience. I believe the Colonel, which was a very foolish thing on my part to do. The night before I left the studio and we were gonna be taping this improv segment the next day, the guard at the guard shack at NBC said, hey Steve, do you need any tickets for tomorrow's performance? I said, what tickets? He said, oh, some bald-headed guy came by, handed me a whole stack of tickets and told me to give them out to anybody who comes in and out of the gate. So we had no audience. We went begging the next morning. <laughs> we went to a drive-in restaurant called Bob's Big Boy and we were asking people while they're eating breakfast, do you want to come see Elvis Presley? We had everybody going crazy inviting their uh, the crew inviting their girlfriends their wives i mean it, just so we could get an audience in there fortunately you know by by time we were ready to tape we had a, an audience that we could surround the stage with we had additional audience sitting up in the bleachers and so forth and it, it turned out fine you want to talk about panic <laughs> i mean i was about as panicked as i could be on top of Elvis, all of a sudden, kind of chickening out and saying, I don't want to do it. And I said, what do you mean you don't want to do it? And he said, Steve, I don't remember anything I said in the dressing room, my mind is a blank. I don't know any of the songs I sang, I don't know any of the stories we all told. So I took an eight by 10 piece of paper and scribbled what I remembered about the improv section, which he took out on stage with him. And I said, Elvis, you know, I've always told you I'll never make you do anything you don't want to do. In this case, you got to go out there. You, and I hear Bob Finkel introducing him on stage while we're in the makeup room having this conversation. And I said, you've got to go out there. I don't care if you walk out there, say hello to everybody, goodbye to everybody and come back, but at least go out there. I turned my back on him. I walked out of the makeup room went up to the control room, which was one flight up, not knowing whether he's coming out or not. I, I just, I didn't wait to hear his answer. And I didn't know he was gonna do the improv until I saw him on one of the TV monitors walking out to the stage.
Normally in television in those days, especially in prime time, the host would come out at the end, say, I hope you had a great time, I enjoyed entertaining for you and so forth and so on. Well, I knew no way could the writers write something for Elvis to speak, even scripted, because the Colonel would say absolutely not. I said, okay, we've had an opportunity now for a few months to really get to know Elvis. He's, he's joined our family. You know who he is, you know what his soul is like. Go write me a song to close the show. You know, you know what the words are gonna be because of, of Elvis, because you know him. He's not this kid from Tupelo, Mississippi, who's a redneck, who has prejudices and so forth. He kind of accepts everybody. Let's tell the people who Elvis really is. In the meantime, the Colonel is saying, Bender's gonna close the show with a Christmas song. He's gonna do Frankie Lane, a 1940s and 50s artist. He's gonna sing, I believe. I believe that every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I'm saying, what does that have to do with Christmas? Steve Bender came to, uh, to Earl and I. He said, uh, write me a song about, and he told us uh, the idea. And uh, Earl went home. And then he came back with If I Can Dream, and as usual, what he called a dummy melody. Well, I listened to this dummy melody. I said, Earl, this is no dummy melody. I said, this is perfect for the song. And he said, no, no, I want you to write one. I said, I can't write one that's as right as this one is. I said, this is right on. And we argued and he just went on and on. No, we write together, we're a collaborative team. I said, listen, I'll write a nice arrangement for it. And uh, I think Elvis should hear this song. Earl had, uh, Earl had figured out the chords to the uh, song. The harmonies were there. So what I had to figure out was how was it going to sound with an orchestra. It was ba dum pum ba da 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 ba dum pum ba da 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 If I can dream, you know. And that little motif sort of gave me a hint as to what the rest of it. I get a phone call very early in the morning saying you got to come out to NBC before rehearsal starts because we think we've got the song for you. So I rush out to NBC that morning. I knew this is the song. So as soon as Elvis shows up, I said, Elvis, come in where the piano is and let them play you a song. And Elvis listens to it. He, Elvis, in his usual way, says, play it again. They're playing it to him like four, five, six times. I knew he wanted to do it because he started to hum it as soon as he heard it, you know. He learned it uh, pretty quickly. And I, in the meantime, I'm hearing Colonel walk into the outer office saying, over my dead body, are they ever going to do that song for the closing? And Elvis looks at me and he says, I'll do it. Door bursts open, in comes the Colonel with Freddie Beanstalk, the head of his publishing company, with a contract ready for Billy and Earl to sign, giving away their publishing rights to the song. Billy Goldenberg goes over to the piano, and there is the piano lead sheet. And it says, music by Billy Goldenberg, lyrics by Earl Brown. And Billy said, I can't take credit for this, it's not true. Earl Brown wrote the music and the lyrics, and he erases his name off the lead sheet. That was kind of the integrity of my staff. I mean, just, you know, just great people, great integrity, honesty, and so forth. And that cost Billy Goldenberg a fortune <laughs> when the song took off. We went out to the recording studio to do the track, and I would have him sing live to the track using all of the musicians that we had hired on the show. After the musicians finished the track and everybody's happy with it, we send them all home. The only people left at the recording studio are Bones Howe, myself, my assistant, script supervisor, Pat Rickey, the utility guy at the recording studio, and Elvis comes over to me and he says, can I put my vocal on it? Because in those days, if you played a vocal in a recording studio, they had to be paid <laughs> exactly as if they were there playing live. So it was very expensive to, to uh, you know, play the tracks. And I said, 
uh, let's turn all the lights off. And it was eerie because there was still the light in the control room, but out on this enormous stage one, all you could see are the red lights from the amplifiers. And you could barely make out through the glass Elvis standing on the stage. And Elvis says, can I have a hand mic? Which is non-traditional when you're making records. Usually it's a little boom mic over your head. You're in a, either in a separate booth or, or uh, you know, you're isolated from the orchestra. And Bones gets him a hand mic. He lies down on this concrete floor, curls himself up into a fetal position with the hand mic up to his mouth. And he now sings so he can learn the lyrics for the show, If I Can Dream. You want to talk about goosebumps? I mean, it's unbelievable. But I had no cameras there. <laughs> so now the choice is, do I have him lip sync, which I hate any artist doing on television, or do I have him sing live on the actual yes, taping today, of, the, of the song? And my decision was, you sing live to the track. No matter how great that recording is with your voice on it, we have no video, and I'm not going to put that on the air. Elvis memorized every note of that orchestration. You could see it because the way he moved, he was moving with the orchestra. And he knew the end of the song, and he knew exactly when it was going to end, and, and he would do that, you know. He was almost happy, yeah. Thank you. Good night. And you have to realize this was probably the first time ever that one one artist dominated the entire show with no guest stars whatsoever, which was in itself a breakthrough. NBC had also looked at the show and said, we don't know if we can air it because his hair's mussed up, you can see him sweating. <laughs> it's all the things that <laughs> made it great. He would inspired us by his abilities to really be, to put everything that we had into it. We wanted it to be good. We wanted it to be great. We ended up with half of America's television audience that night watching Elvis Presley. That meant they had to tune out of the other networks and come over at nine o'clock halfway through their other shows to watch Elvis. So we were a huge success when, when the show actually was broadcast initially. It was the thrill of my life as it was for every guy and girl who worked on the show. We were looking at the show 50 years after taping it, and it still stands up beautifully. It, it was an experience of my life that I shall never forget, and I'm honored and privileged to be the guy who happened to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs>